God is on time. And if God would go through all of this intricate plan to send his son from heaven to earth, don't you think that he's got you covered? Do you think anything is slipping through his fingers at this point in your life? Do you have any right to pull out your hair and go, I'm worried? Perfect timing, perfect plan, perfect person, perfect reason. So this is a good time for you to lay down your worry, lay down your burden, and start trusting in him. The first century, however, especially the generation before the destruction of the second temple, witness a remarkable outburst of messianic emotionalism. When Jesus came into Galilee, spreading the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, he was voicing the opinion universally held that the age of the kingdom of God was at hand. And he closes the paragraph by saying the Messiah was expected at the second quarter of the first century. Close quote. You know when Jesus came? Second quarter, first century. No wonder when John the Baptist is down at the Jordan River plopping people in the water, baptizing them, the first questions out of the mouth of the rulers in Jerusalem is, are you the Messiah? They were expecting him. And that expectation was at its all-time high. So the expectation was right. Second thing to make note of is the season was right. Look at verse 4. Paul says, when the fullness of the time had come. Stop. That's a very intriguing phrase. Fullness, pleroma is the Greek word, means um, complete or full or plump or ripe. The time was perfect, he is saying. The time was ripe, like fruit hanging on a tree, ready to be plucked at just the right moment. It was the fullness of the time. Now, have you noticed that God is into doing things on time? Very precise about that. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tells us there is a time for every purpose under heaven. And if you notice that God keeps perfect time, his watch is perfect. Sometimes you think God is late. You're just early. You think God is slow. No, you're just a little too fast. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, the great clock of the universe keeps good time. And the whole machinery of providence moves with unerring punctuality. I've had people tell me, you know, Jesus was a man ahead of his time. Or, well, Jesus was behind the times. No, 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 no. He came at the fullness of the time. First words out of his mouth recorded in the Gospel of Mark were, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. So... Paul says the season was right. It was the fullness of the time. Now, he does not tell us specifically what made the time so ripe, but let me make a few suggestions. The time was right spiritually. I've already told you how there was an expectation, a spiritual expectation at the time of Christ, unlike any other time. They were open. They wanted, they were hungry for the Messiah to come. But not only that, did you know that other religions like the Roman religious system and the Greek religious system, that many of the people who subscribed to those beliefs, there was a hunger going on inside of them. They were burned out on the Roman polytheistic form of worship or the Greek polytheism. And they were attracted to Judaism's one God. And so many were converting in different parts of the world in the first century to Judaism. In fact, if you read your New Testament, you know that the centurion is spoken about favorably in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Many of them believed in the Lord Jesus, commended one centurion for having more faith than any Jewish people in the entire land. Uh, in the book of Acts, there's a centurion who invites Peter into his house and comes to faith in Christ. Paul writes about people from Caesar's household converting and following Jesus. So it was the right time spiritually. But it was also the right time culturally for Jesus to come. You know, Alexander the Great had a dream. Of course, he was dead by this time. But he, he had a dream that he could make the world Greek. 
He was a Greek. He wanted to spread the love. So he thought everybody in the world should speak his language and follow his culture. So his dream was to spread Greek language and Greek culture around the world. And you know what? He was pretty successful. Because for the first time since the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis, during the New Testament times, there was a common language around the world, and that was Greek. It was said that you could go from the British Isles all the way to India speaking the same language everywhere you went. And what a language it was. The language of Greek. The most precise language ever to convey human thought, and that is the language of the New Testament. Ah, but not only that, Alexander the Great, when he conquered Jerusalem, he encouraged the Jews to travel around the world and colonize the world into pockets of Judaism wherever they went. So that by the time of Jesus, you had these things, you don't find them in the Old Testament, but you find them in the New, synagogues, Jewish meeting places in virtually every city around the world where somebody could pop in speaking a common language and share ideas. So it was the right time spiritually, culturally, but it was also the right time politically. And here's what I mean. The king of the world was Rome. Caesar was in charge. And Rome brought with it what they called the Pax Romana. You've heard the term? It means the Roman peace. It was 200 years of peace on earth, at least in the Roman world. And it was... It was pretty peaceful. It was a stability enforced by Roman military, essentially. The power of Rome ensured that the places Rome controlled were peaceful places. So they brought in the Pax Romana. Rome also brought in a road system. Get this. This is 2,000 years ago. Rome decided to connect all the places in the world that had not been connected by a road system. They built 250 thousand miles of roads many of them are still paved today you can walk on them they're made out of stone 250,000 miles folks that's 2,000 years ago I know roads in Rio Rancho that still aren't paved <laughs> the Romans paved the world at the time so now you have relative safety where people can travel from one part of the world to another part of the world speaking the same language and bringing their ideas with them and you know who took advantage of that? Paul the Apostle. It's estimated the Apostle Paul traveled 15,000 miles on foot or by sea during his lifetime. So now you have the gospel in the most precise language ever, under the most ideal circumstances ever, to people who are hungrier than ever, going to places more freely than ever before. It was the fullness of time. So the expectation was right. The season was right. There's something else that was right. The action was right. Look at verse 4 again. But when the fullness of the time had come, God, now watch how this is written, God sent forth his son. Stop right there. I want you to think about that. God sent forth his son. That implies that Jesus was in one place first before he got sent somewhere else. This phraseology suggests preexistence. The Knox translation puts it this way. God sent out his son on a mission to us. He was somewhere else first, then he got sent here. No wonder then Jesus said to Pontius Pilate as he stood before him, for this reason I came into the world. I came into the world. It's what Isaiah the prophet predicted. In Isaiah chapter 7, unto us a child is born, but unto us a son is given. Yes, Jesus was born, but first he was sent by the Father. So in John chapter 6, Jesus put it this way, I came down from heaven. John chapter 8, I proceeded forth and came from God. So let me spell it all out. Jesus Christ was in the presence of God the Father, eternally existing as the second person of the triune God, 
And at just the right time, God the Father sprung into action and dispatched his son on a mission to this earth, a rescue mission, from his presence to our presence. The action was right. Not only that, the person was right. Look again at the fourth verse. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son. And notice how he is described. Born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus was the right person for the job. And the listing of his qualifications is here. He was born of a woman. Now that's an odd thing to say, isn't it? Because who isn't? Everybody born is born of a woman. There's a religion in Israel called the Druze religion. It's from Egypt, actually. And it's the belief that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be born from a man. And it's an odd belief system. But Paul skips all that nonsense and says, no, no, no. Born of a woman. But the reason he includes this, because it's an obvious statement, everybody's born of woman, is he doesn't make mention of a man. He doesn't say born of a woman and a man. He isolates it and says he's born of a woman. Why? Because Jesus was born as the result of Mary being conceived by the Holy Spirit. Joseph had nothing to do with his birth at all. So he was born of a woman. Then look what else it says, born under the law. He's not just a man, he's a Jewish man. He was circumcised the eighth day. He was dedicated in the temple. He was raised in a Jewish home, reading the Torah, worshiping the God of Israel. He attended the synagogue services. We know that. Like every Jewish male, he was bar mitzvahed, became a, a son of the commandment. But unlike every other male, he actually kept the commandments because he was sinless. He was perfect. There was no sin at all in him. So this is the right person. Now, I've said this before, but um, I need to underscore this. Jesus had to be both God and man to be a savior. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. He has to be fully God and fully man. And that's how Paul presents him. That's how the prophets present him. That's how the gospel writers present him. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he had to be both. Otherwise, what he did wouldn't have any consequence at all. He had to be human because he is representing humanity. So he has to feel all the pain of the punishment that is put upon him at the cross. But he also has to be God for his sacrifice to have enough value to atone for sin. If I tell you, I'm going to die for the sins of the world, and then I die. You know what just happened? I died. That's it. My death is of no value, even though I said I'm dying for the sins of the world. The only one who would have value is somebody who is absolutely perfect who lived the perfect life that we could never live, and then was sacrificed. Fully God, fully man.
Now, I want to just step back from this for a moment and just tell you that this is what differentiates Christianity from every other belief system, every other philosophy, every other religion. It centers on a person, not on somebody's teachings. So many other religions, it's all about follow the teachings uh, of this person or follow the example of that person. With Christianity, it centers on Christ, period. Jesus never said, follow my teachings, though his teachings are important. He said, follow me. He never said, my teachings are the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He never says, as many as received my core belief system will become children of God. He said, whoever received him would have the right to become children of God. So he had to be God, had to be man, had to be Jewish man. Had to come at the right time. Had to come when the expectation was at an all-time high. And to what end? For what reason? Verse 5 tells us the reason was right. Look at the first two words. To what? To redeem. That's why he came. To redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption. I love that. As sons or children of God. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. If you go to Israel today, you'll see little kids calling after their dads, and they'll say, Abba, Abba, means daddy. It's an intimate term of relationship. Abba, daddy. So here, once again, is the language of slavery. To redeem, to buy back by paying a price to set a slave free. That's what the word ex agorazo or to redeem means so to redeem god went to the slave market of sin he bought you he took you home and he adopted you that's beautiful that's what paul is saying the son of god became a slave to allow slaves to become sons of god now what does that mean to us it means you're not under bondage any longer this is what it means to you you don't have to grit your teeth and try to perform to make God like you. I got to work really hard so God likes me and accepts me. Done. Sorry, too late. He's already did that for you. What he did was enough for him to go to the slave market, buy you, bring you home, and adopt you. So you don't have to perform for him. Yes, he wants you to be obedient to him. Don't mistake what I'm saying. But you are accepted. You are adopted. You are a child, a son or daughter of God. So everything was set up perfectly. And at the right time, God sent the right person. And that right person was Shiloh. Remember, I, I said that at the beginning, and I mentioned Genesis 49. So let's close on that note. Look with me at the 49th chapter of Genesis, and I want to show you something from that text. Genesis 49, as I mentioned, is the old patriarch Jacob. He is a deathbed prophet. He brings his sons around him and goes through one son and then another son, then another son, says something about their personality, says something about their future. We get to Genesis 49, verse 8. He gets to his son Judah, who will be the father of the tribe of Judah. And he says, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. That's a play on the word Judah. Judah means praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? This is where the term, the lion of the tribe of Judah from the book of Revelation comes from this idea in Genesis 49. But look at verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. You know what a scepter is, right? Scepter is a staff, a tribal staff that shows identity and authority. And in this case, it's the identity and the authority of the tribe of Judah. So the scepter, the rule, the identity shall not depart, nor 
Notice what it says, a lawgiver from between his feet. So the Jewish interpretation was the right to rule and the right to enforce the law of Moses on the people. So that's going to be intact in Judah until Shiloh comes. You know what Shiloh means? It means the one to whom it belongs. The one to whom it belongs. And for centuries, rabbis taught this verse is a prediction of the Messiah who would come. The Jewish Targums, remember that book I told you about a few weeks ago? We went through all this. The Targums, the Jewish Targums, the Jewish Midrash, the Jewish Talmud all agree this is a messianic prophecy. Giving a specific time of his arrival. So to expand it all, it says Judah's national identity, which includes its right to enforce the Mosaic law, will not depart from Judah until the Messiah comes. You follow me so far? We have a little bit of a problem. Judah was taken captive by the Babylonians for 70 years. Remember that? When they were taken captive in 586 BC, they lost national sovereignty because they were slaves now. But they never lost national identity. In fact, they still in Babylon had lawgivers and judges among their own tribe. The Babylonians let them do that. Then they came back. They repopulated the land. But then something happened in the first quarter of the first century, just before the second quarter of the first century, to be precise, 23 years before the trial of Jesus of Nazareth, something happened. Rome, that had taken over the world, including the Jewish nation, took away from Judah the right to adjudicate in capital cases... They took away the right to impose the law of Moses in capital cases. This is why they had to bring Jesus to Pilate to get him crucified, because the right of capital punishment was taken away from the Jews. They got to get him killed. They go to Pilate to have the Roman sentence dropped, and Jesus died. So what happened when that happened? The Jews knew this is what Genesis 49 is written about. Now I'm going to read to you a passage from the Jerusalem Talmud, by Rabbi Rachmon, who said, and I quote, when the members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived of their right over life and death, a general consternation took possession of them. They covered themselves with sackcloth and ashes, exclaiming, woe to us, for the scepter has departed from Judah, but the Messiah has not come. That actually happened. 23 years before the trial of Jesus of Nazareth, in the first quarter of the first century, the Jewish leader said, we know what this means. The scepter has indeed departed, Genesis 49.10, but the Messiah, Shiloh, has not come. While they were parading in mourning in Jerusalem, a little boy was playing in Nazareth. He was growing up under Joseph and Mary, and he was about to put his carpentry tools down and start his public ministry. And one day he would be sitting on a donkey and he would be riding into Jerusalem fulfilling what the prophecy said. And when he did, some knew, not all, Shiloh had come. The scepter has departed, but Shiloh, this is it, has come. At just the right time, under just the right circumstances, for exactly the right reason. Now, as we close today, I want some of you who are discouraged by whatever's going on in your life, and you feel like God's timing is way off, and you're looking and going, God, you're late. No, you may be early. You may be looking at the wrong clock, but God is on time. And if God would go through all of this intricate plan to send his son from heaven to earth. Don't you think that he's got you covered? Don't you think, do you think anything is slipping through his fingers at this point in your life? Do you have any right to pull out your hair and go, I'm worried? What? What, what, what? Perfect timing, perfect plan, perfect person, perfect reason.
As followers of Jesus Christ, we leave a God print behind whenever we partner with God to influence the world for the cause of Christ. No matter your past or your current circumstances, you can leave a lasting God-centered impression on the world. And we want to help you do that by sending you Skip Heitzig's new book, God Print, Making Your Mark for Christ. Dive into the life of Abraham, a story overflowing with fear, crisis, adventure, and faith. And discover how the greatest legacy you can leave behind is letting God use you to accomplish amazing things for His kingdom. God Print is our way to say thanks for your gift today to help connect more people to God's Word through Connect with Skip Heitzig so they can discover their purpose and start making their mark. So call now to get your copy of God Print when you give. Call 800-922-1888. That's 800-922-1888. Or you can give online securely at connectwithskip.com offer.